sermon title today is Only One Gospel. And this, this morning we continue with our study of the Apostle's warning letter that he wrote to the Galatians. How many of you have learned something new in this study on the book of Galatians? I know I have. There's there's a lot in here that if we just read through it, we'll completely miss. And I think that's probably true on just about any uh, chapter in the Bible. If we just kind of read through it, there's just so much more available. It is my prayer that by the end of the series on Galatians that you will be rooted and grounded in the rock Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That no Judaizer will be able to lead you to any other gospel other than the one that Paul preached from the very beginning. That he himself said was from Jesus himself. And I want to lead you into a parable this morning. Are you ready? This one is not found in the scriptures. This this one just kind of happened. So we're, we're going to, I want you to let it paint a picture in your mind's eye. And I pray that you'll see the message in it very clearly. Let's imagine that you and your family are going to take a trip to the land of your ancestors. Well, if you're like me, that's uh, English and German and Irish and French and who knows what else. But in our story today, there's, there's only one destination. That we are going to go to one single place. After you arrive, you check into your hotel and the very first thing you do is go to the rail station. And at the rail station, you buy your rail pass. And you give one to every single person in your family. You know, this single rail pass has many benefits that you enjoy if you spend your time in your home country. First, it saves you time because you won't have to stand in line to get tickets every stop. Next, it saves you money because when you buy one for a certain length of time, you don't have to buy those individual tickets and there's usually a pretty good cost savings because using the rail pass for a certain length of time is much cheaper. It also facilitates your plans for the day because the rail pass is for one certain company. And when you look at the large guide board on the wall of the station, your entire route is shown in the color green. Does your mind see that board, you know, on the wall with the rail tracks in there? The color green. So when you go to the station, you look at the map, and you fix your eyes on the green line. You can decide if you need to stay on the green line all day or venture off shortly, but your focus is always on the green line. That is your central point of reference. You plan your travels around the green line. Second only to your passport, this rail pass is very important. Well, how do we know that it's very important? Well, it's because when you first bought the cards and handed each one of your children one of those cards, your instructions were, make sure you don't lose the card, right? That's not a suggestion. That is a command that is issued in the imperative. Be sure you do not lose this card. And each morning as you leave the hotel, the reminder of the day is, everyone bring your rail pass 
and stay on the green line. God has given us something much more important than a rail pass. You see that one coming, did you? <laughs> but God has given us something much more important, folks. He gave us the gospel. The gospel is the heart of Christianity. The gospel leads you back to God through Christ. The gospel originates with from God. The gospel is your green line. It will always lead you and your family in the right direction. It will not allow you to become hopelessly lost. And Paul, was in, and Paul has instructed us of this vital truth several times already in our study of the letters uh, to the Galatian churches. Today we extend this lesson even farther. The gospel comes from God, and, and how many gospels did God give us? Does anybody have a, have a notion of how many gospels were given? One. One. A plus for everybody. <laughs> Paul emphatically tells us there is only one gospel. And this single gospel can be taught in different ways. And Paul was an expert. He brought it in from this way and this way and this way and this way. But it all came to the same exact gospel. We're going to look at what this gospel can do. We're all going to look at what we can do with the gospel. Paul gives us the answers to these questions in the first 10 verses of chapter 2 of the book of Galatians. How is Paul going to teach us this truth? He is once again going to use his own autobiography. He tells us his story again. Let's now look at verses 1 and 2, and here we learn from Paul that believers are united by one gospel. In verse 1, he tells us that he made a second visit to Jerusalem 14 years after his conversion. We see that his traveling companions were Barnabas and Titus. Barnabas is a Jew from Cyprus, and he is descended from the tribe of Levi. And Titus, Paul tells us, is an uncircumcised Gentile or Greek Gentile. What do these two facts tell us about Titus? It is that he is indeed a Gentile. The other two guys are Jews. What about Paul himself? He is a Jew from Tarsus and is descended from the tribe of Benjamin, who had a great success as a Pharisee persecuting the Christian church. And we, we studied on that earlier. Now we see them walking together on the road to Jerusalem. In terms of nationality, we find two Jews from different tribes and one Gentile. And in terms of appointment, we have one who is an apostle and missionary, one another who is a missionary, and one who is an elder fully in charge of certain uh, ministries in Crete. Despite their differences, the three individuals have one spiritual identity. They have been converted. They are Christians. They belong to one common spiritual family. They are each a child of God. They have a common cause. They bring the gospel that saved them to unbelievers. They have common habits. They can be seen praying together before they eat their meals. You do that, right? Even when you're at McDonald's. I mean, you can tell who the Christians in the room are because they are saved hers before, they're, before they eat. Why is all this true about them? Because they have one common faith. They believe that Jesus died and rose again to save them. They believe the gospel that came from God. So from the composition of the travelers, we see a picture of unity. Men of different nationalities, men of different ages, men of different callings, but they all found a common bond, a common cause, a common code of conduct 
because they believe in the exact same gospel. We can see this gospel unity not only in the who, but in the why. Why did these three men go to Jerusalem? There's an obvious reason and a not so obvious reason. The obvious reason is in verse 2. And Paul tells us that he went to Jerusalem in response to a what? A revelation. Whose revelation? We see in the context of, the, of this verse that is a revelation of Jesus Christ to Paul. Christ through the Spirit prompted them to make this trip. <coughs> Why were they directed to make this trip? You know, it was to establish <coughs> me, that Paul is one with the rest of the apostles. It is to make the leading apostles, Peter, James, and John, see that Paul is preaching the very same gospel that they are. Remember that we what we have recently discovered, Paul told us that three years after his conversion, he made his first trip to Jerusalem and spent 15 days with Peter and James also. So in that first meeting in Jerusalem, why did they not accept Paul as one of the apostles? You ever thought about that? Why did they not realize yet that Paul was preaching the exact same gospel that they were? Paul does not tell us in this book, but Luke tells us in chapter Acts chapter 9. And that's why it's the not so obvious, because Galatians, Paul doesn't mention it, but Luke does in the book of Acts. When Paul first set foot in Jerusalem, the believers were afraid of him. He had just been throwing every Christian he could find in prison. I, I can hear him say, the notorious persecutor of Christians has become one of us. Can we trust him? Can this be a play to trap us? Is Paul's conversion real? Is his commission to preach the gospel real? What, what do you think? Did the apostles really believe his story in, in that first meeting? Not really. They, they really didn't. And if, and if you examine these two meetings, you'll see the difference. It was obviously not, as a matter of fact, because if they did, Paul would not say in verse 9 that Peter, James, and John had now given them the right hand of fellowship. That tells us it didn't happen before. That Peter, James, and John had now given them the right hand of fellowship. In the first meeting, in those 15 days, there was not enough time for the apostles to resolve the issue with Paul. And as we learned before, that there wasn't time enough for Paul to have gotten his gospel from the, the uh, Jerusalem apostles. Not in 15 days. On that first trip to, to Jerusalem... Paul got into a bit of trouble accusing the Judaizers the way he did, so they were plotting to kill him, and so uh, Paul's life was in danger once again. He was always in hot, hot water somewhere. Before things could be resolved with the rest of the apostles, the believers had to send Paul away from Jerusalem to Tarsus. Subsequently, Barnabas brought Paul from Tarsus to Antioch. And Paul stayed and ministered in Antioch for quite some time before he made the second trip to Jerusalem. And at this second meeting, that which was not resolved with the leading apostles in the first meeting was resolved and put to rest. Peter, James, and John now believed that Paul 
preached the same gospel as them, and they agreed that Paul had truly received the gospel directly from Jesus Christ. And Paul was now commissioned by the church, you could say, to preach the gospel. You know, we have seen the obvious reason that the trio was in Jerusalem. But how about the not so obvious reason? The, call, the reason I call it the not so obvious is because like I said before, it's not in Galatians, it's in the book of Acts. And it's on your, on your handout, Acts 11, 28. One of them, named Abacus, Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world, and this happened during the reign of Claudius. The brethren at Antioch realized that the believers in Judea would be greatly affected by the famine. Luke puts it this way, Acts 11, 29, and 30. The disciples, as each one was able, now notice, it called the believers disciples, not just those three. It couldn't be those three because it says that the disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So we see our second reason that these guys went to Jerusalem. What were they carrying with them to Jerusalem? Famine relief, right? They were taking care of their brothers and sisters in Judea. You know, in Christ, the suffering of the believers in Jerusalem became the suffering of the believers in Antioch. In Christ, we are all what? One. In the, in the two reasons that we are looking at, we see one thing, one overarching truth. We see Christian unity displayed. Christ's apostles are one. They believe and preach the same gospel. Gentile and Jewish believers are one, bonded by the same gospel. The believers in Antioch shared in the plight of their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And as we closely examine verses 1 and 2, what do we see? We see a beautiful picture of Christian unity. When a third party sees us from outside, so if somebody comes here and begins to interview each one of us individually, asking us questions about our faith, about the gospel, Christian unity. What will they find? Are we one because we believe the same gospel? Suppose the third party goes around the church and interviews us one by one. Will they receive a real shock? Will his reaction be, my goodness, this church is a sponge cake? <laughs> Might not be the best example, but I think it works for me. So here it goes. What is a sponge cake? Well, it's that one that is all together on the outside. It's smooth. There, there's, it's just solid. You can tell it is together. <laughs> until you cut it open. What's on the inside? A bunch of holes, right? Things aren't quite together on the inside like they are on the outside. You know, we must be of one heart because we believe in the same one gospel. How do we achieve this? 
If I may step slightly out of context, I would say that this, I would say this to you. Go and read through all the epistles of Paul. Each time that Paul teaches the same, he, say, he teaches the same gospel, the same doctrine. You know, then shortly after, he gives us the ethical demands. And what are the ethical demands? They're the practical attitudes and actions that believers must take because of their doctrinal beliefs. In the book of Romans, for instance, the first 11 chapters teach the church gospel doctrine. Then they that believe the gospel doctrine, from chapter 12 onward, he tells them how the belief should affect their everyday life. And we could say this as a statement. First, we see doctrine. Then, we see mission. First, we see what? Doctrine. doctrine. Then, we see mission. mission. That's how Paul writes. He tells us the truth, and then he shows us how we should respond to that truth. Let me ask you, are... Are there unresolved issues between the brothers and sisters in this church? I don't know of any, but it's a question that we must ask ourselves. Please do not leave them open. Seek reconciliation with one another. Close up the wounds. It may not heal immediately. Some wounds run deep, even if others can't even imagine why, but it doesn't matter because it's you. If need be, take baby steps to reconciliation. Someone needs to take the first step and it might as well be you, right? If this church is not just as one as the church of Paul's day, how can we ever expect the same results that they saw? Do you want this church to grow by 3,000 in one day? Amen? Amen. That will never happen without Holy Spirit power and Christian unity. I have some good news for you. Who wants to hear some good news? We had ministers' meetings with the with the uh, many of the elders in attendance, either by Zoom or, or in attendance, and I know Roger was there. The ministerial director for the union came and brought a whole band load of stuff. One of the things that he brought was baptismal robes. Because we need them. And he got up and made a short speech and he said, you know, if, if a church is growing by either 2 or 4%, I can't remember. He said, well, they're, they're hanging on. And if a church is growing by 7 or 8%, hey, they're moving forward. But if a church is growing by 10%, praise the Lord. And every other union or every other conference in our union is growing by 10%. Praise the Lord, right? <coughs> what do you think Mountain View is doing? Remember, I'm, I got, I'm bringing good news. 20%. 35. 34%. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Our conference is moving. And I'm crazy. But, and, and I just had to throw that in there. That was, that's not part of the sermon. But you need to know that. There's things going on around here. 
You know, it took 14 years for Paul to be recognized as an apostle by Peter, James, and John. It took the same 14 years before they could officially view the apostles and their gospel as one. Think about this for a moment. If Paul had not taken his second trip to Jerusalem, it would not change his commission to preach the gospel at all. Because he was given that by Jesus. He didn't need Peter, James, and John to give him the holy sign or something. Jesus commissioned him. Jesus commissioned the other three. He knows that he has been called by Jesus himself to be his apostle, to preach his gospel. And that is good enough for Paul. So he even suggests that he does not require the acceptance of the other apostles. But why did he go to Jerusalem again? Remember what he said in verse 2. I went in response to a what? A revelation. Paul may have been fine with not going to meet the others. And the others may have been fine with Paul not coming to unite with them. My friends, Jesus was not okay with that. Jesus instructed him to go. It was Jesus' idea that these guys needed to be one. One in mission. Their gospel had to be the same and everybody needed to know it. Jesus is the one that brought them together. He wants his church to be united, not scattered all over the half acres. He wants us to be one in Christ. After Paul was united with the apostles in Jerusalem, he and Barnabas went back to Antioch. The Antioch believers were inspired to send Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, without which many churches, including those in Galatia, would never have been established. God needs his people to be united, or he can't use us to our full potential. Do you want to be used by God to your full potential? Amen. Do you feel that God is calling you to something? Do you feel the call of God on your life? Folks, fulfill that ministry right here in this church. This church needs you. Not because you're, you're a great something, but because God doesn't give a call to you without giving you whatever you need to fulfill it. And this church is going to explode. It's not going to grow two or three a year. Because there's going to be unity right here in this church. Everybody's going to be preaching the exact same gospel. Look what Jesus did for me and this is what he can do for you. It's that simple. We don't have to be a great oratory. Jesus called for the unity of his church. Satan will be the one calling you to separate from it. He will always attempt to divide, and if he can divide, he will conquer. There's one flock, and there's one shepherd, and if someone is leading you to another gospel, run. Don't walk. Run away. Please. Paul tells us, Galatians 2, 3 through 5. 
Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. In the context, you could say, follow Jewish tradition. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul saw him not giving in for an hour as necessary to pre be able to bring to you the one gospel. You know, the first ten verses of Galatians chapter 2 are about Christian unity. Included in these verses are a warning of false teachers coming in to separate the flock and to divide you to a different gospel that is not the gospel, but is a false gospel. You know, the following instructions have been given to me and to you. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Then what does it say? Preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, will, they will heap up for themselves teachers. But they will turn their ears, and, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful, in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and then what does it say? Fulfill your ministry. And I believe that's the call of God on each and every one of us. Fulfill your ministry, and what's the last line? Folks, if we are... With God's help, we are invincible. Things are going to happen here. God is going to move. I want to be a part of that. How about you? Amen. If you want to be a part of the ministry of this church, if you want to be a part of the exciting work that God's going to do right here, because this church is united. They are one. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Blessed be the tie that finds, number 350.